right. All right, let's get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Devin Rhodes, and I am the Director of Alumni Relations. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this beautiful evening for Making and Marketing Children's Books with Kara Bramer and Laura Harshberger. Um, also from Susquehanna University, I am happy to say that we have President Jonathan Green and our First Lady, Ms. Lynn Buck with us, and also Vice President of Advancement, uh, Melissa Kimura. So thank you for joining us as well. Uh, before I turn the program over, um, just to let everybody know, we will use the Q&A and chat features uh, to ask questions at the end of Kara and Laura's presentation. Uh, we also have some incredible questions that were pre-submitted, so thank you to those who um, have sent in questions. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, for this evening. Uh, Kara Bramer, class of 2013, and Laura Harshberger, class of 2012. Um, at Susquehanna, Kara was a creative writing major and a publishing and editing minor. Kara is currently the Assistant Director of Trade Marketing at Penguin Young Readers, a division of Penguin Random House. She works on middle grade and young adult novels, such as The Last Kids on Earth and the New York Times bestselling Miss Pereg Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children series, and for authors like Amanda Gorman, John Green, and Jacqueline Woodson. Um, at Susquehanna University. Now, Laura was an English major, but a publishing and editing minor, and I think that is how the two of them then met. Uh, Laura is a senior production ed editor for HarperCollins Children's Books, uh, where she contributes her copy editing and project management skills to a variety of books for young readers, ranging from the New York Times bestselling Pete the Cat series, to critically acclaimed young adult novels like Felix Ever After. Laura's interest in the publishing industry uh, was born out of her time here at Susquehanna University's English department, where she was the first enrollee in the university's publishing and editing minor. So welcome, Kara and uh, Laura. Um, thank you so much and take it away. Thanks, Evan. Thanks so much, Devin. Um, hi, everyone. As you know, I'm Laura Harshberger, and um, I'm going to get us started tonight. I think Kara's going to, we're going to have just a little background screen while we talk. Um, but I'm a senior production editor at HarperCollins Children's Books, um, and I have worked my whole career since I graduated from SU in uh, the same kind of work in publishing, which is managing ed, production ed work. Um, and pretty much what that means is uh, managing editorial is kind of the umbrella organization in a publishing house that works uh, with and between all of the different departments that are working to get a book published. Um, so we work really closely with editorial, with manufacturing production, with marketing and design um, to make sure that our projects are being completed on time and that they're being completed to the highest quality possible. Uh, so as a production editor, my main jobs are project management and then quality assurance. Um, make sure that the, and since the, you know, the product that we're putting out into the world is a book, uh, the quality assurance that I'm doing is with text and language. So um, I spend a lot, of, a lot of my day looking at text, AKA reading books. Um, so I wanted to explain a little bit about what copy editing is, and then I'm gonna go through my role in a, in a project, um, you know, how I work on books. Um, so copy editing um, is different from line editing, which is what ed the editorial department does with authors. They work on stories, and plot and making sure that this is a book that's going to be interesting and engaging for the and I come in after that process to work on um, correcting errors, um, spelling, fact checking, um, and creating and maintaining a consistent style for the book. Um, so pretty much the way it works is 
after the, the editor and the publisher have acquired a project and they've worked with the author on it, they'll transmit it to my department and it'll come to me, a production editor. And I'll take a look at the manuscript. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to assess if it has any special needs. Is there a lot of language other than English in the manuscript? Um, are there historical aspects of it that need to be uh, fact checked or, you know, reviewed? Um, and then I will, you know, depending on its needs, I'll send it out to a contractor for an intensive read um, because what's going to happen is somebody's going to spend 15 to 20 hours on it. And I'm working on 50 to 60 of these at a time. I don't have those 15 hours in every week. So some of them, you know, they're going to go out and be read by someone else. And then when it comes back, um, you know, I'll hire that person. It'll come back and I'll review their work and make sure everything, you know, looks good. And then it'll go back to the editor who will work with the author on it again. And then it comes back to me again. I'm going to be typeset and then to go to the design department. And design will work on um, how the book is going to look. Uh, you know, the layout on the page, the font, um, you know, designed chapter openers, that kind of thing. And then it will again come back to me. Um, and this time it will be in layouts. It will look the way it's going to look when we print it on the page. Um, and then what do we do? We read it again. Um, this time we proofread it. Um, proofreading is reading text against the previous version of it. So this time we're gonna read it word for word, comparing it to the manuscript that was previously used. Um, and again, we're just looking to make sure that everything is consistent um, and accurate and um, you know, no typos, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll do that uh, as many times as we need to until there are no more mistakes or we find nothing and it's clean. And then uh, that could happen anywhere from, you know, two to three times is ideal. It could happen six or seven times if we need to, if the author is making late adjustments, that kind of thing. Um, and then at the end, we transmit the materials to the manufacturing production department. They will work with the printer um, to make sure to have the book become a physical book, to have it be printed. And depending on what kind of project it is, we may then review final materials from the printer. Again, just making sure that nothing went wrong in the process. Um, everything looks the way it should until we approve. And then six, eight, six to eight weeks later or two to three months later, depending on what kind of project it is, it's a printed book, it's in our warehouse and it goes out to stores. Um, so that's pretty much my role. Uh, I've been doing this kind of work, um, again, my whole, my whole career from my first job out of college uh, until now. And um, what's interesting is that my first job out of school was uh, in academic publishing. I was working on uh, journals for like a college student and an academic audience. And my next job was um, for commercial trade fiction for adults until I had the opportunity to come over to Harper about five years ago to work on children's books. Um, so while my career advanced, the content that I was working on kind of went, you know, from a, in a simplification direction. Um, what's interesting is that when you're making picture books and young uh, reader editions and, uh, you know, like our I Can Read series, which is about teaching kids, you know, language, uh, there's, there's no margin for error in books like that. So even though the content is simpler, my job of quality assurance to do it on children's books is the most um, intensive and important uh, work that you can do in this regard because, uh, you know, parents are trusting us to, to teach their kids how to read and you can't have a typo in a picture book. You could, you could pick up any 300 page book in your house right now. There's a typo somewhere in it, but if you pick up a 32 page picture book, there isn't, <laughs> or there hopefully isn't. So, so that's my role in the process. And I'm gonna throw it over to Karen now to talk about hers. Thanks, Laura. Uh, that's a really good point. I really 
<laughs> hadn't thought about that, like the care that's needed for that. I feel like we all say that managing editorial is the true unsung heroes of publishing. Like you are all there behind the scenes every step of the way, making sure the book is actually made. Uh, because without that, I can't do my job, which is to make sure we're finding the reader base uh, for those books. Uh, so similar to Laura, I've been working in the marketing side of publishing uh, since I graduated from Susquehanna. Uh, and I've actually been in children's books uh, the full time of my career. Um, and Laura and I actually just missed each other because I started at HarperCollins uh, in the children's book department. And then I moved over to Penguin and I'm, um, I'm close to six years there now. Uh, so as mentioned, I focus on middle grade and young adult books. Uh, so that really is for readers uh, in like uh, grade three and up um, and then into high school. And we really do see a big crossover audience um, with the young adult um, books lots of adults are reading them so we definitely try to make sure that they they know about new publications from us as well so i'm on the trade retail marketing team and what that means is i'm really working with our booksellers so as you know where you find your books is from barnes and noble an indie bookstore amazon uh you might have audiobooks that you enjoy from audible um, or you read ebooks my team is making sure that all of our booksellers and our sales force is equipped with the information needed to sell those books to those accounts. So that way, as a reader, you can find those and purchase those. Uh, we do have a direct to consumer um, sales strategy, but it's absolutely not our priority. We really uh, appreciate and focus on our relationships with those book selling accounts and we try to work with them and support them in any way that we can. So that's what my marketing is really about. So um, as Laura is working on the book, um, I am selling it into those accounts and working with the sales team. Uh, so that can just be figuring out how do we want to sum up this book in two to three sentences? Um, you know, you think about the flap if you open the book and you see those couple of paragraphs. That's from editorial and managing um, editorial, of course, checks that too. They check everything. And then marketing kind of puts our own spin on it. How do we make this the lowest common denominator messaging so that the right reader knows this is the right book for them? So we equip our sales team and our booksellers with all of that information. So that way, when a customer goes online, um, they understand the book page and it's the most appealing to them to perhaps make a purchase. Or if they go in store, hopefully we'll be able to do that a lot more soon. You talk to your favorite indie bookseller and they're able to recommend and really talk about the books uh, that we have coming out. So that's really where my job starts. Um, and then I'm also really a li liaison in between our editors, our publishers, and then our authors and our agents. So uh, as we craft our marketing plans, um, we work with the editors to make sure that we are packaging those and supporting our authors and showing them all of the great ways that we're gonna make sure uh, their book is welcomed out into the universe. Um, and this can be everything from um, digital marketing, social media plays a giant role, especially in the young adult. Um, with younger children, it's a little bit, um, harder to target them just because of legal restrictions, which are obviously there for good childcare protection reasons. So for that reason, we are really targeting the parents um, when we're doing marketing for middle grade and lower. Um, and then we also, of course, do advertising. And then we have a very dedicated school and library marketing team. Um, so those are the people really working with uh, teachers and librarians uh, to help our sell in to libraries as well and into classroom sets. Um, that's a big part of the children's market as well. Um, and then finally, the last part of my job, um, I oversee our consumer festival uh, approach. So um, before COVID, that meant traveling around the country to book fairs and conventions um, where we would set up booths uh, and I would get to play indie bookseller for a few days. And I found that so much fun because especially for the ones that were for teenagers, um, just seeing school bus after school bus pull up and seeing thousands of kids so excited about books and so excited to like just get bookmarks and stickers um, and meet some of their favorite authors. Um, it's so fulfilling to see firsthand the work that we're doing and the kids that we're impacting. Um, so of course that's changed a little bit and we'll talk about that as we discuss the pandemic shift, um, but we have been able to find some creative ways to still interact with our uh, readers um, and have fun with our authors while we've all been uh, in the virtual space. So I think next we're going to get into a little bit about how our jobs changed over the last year because they both changed pretty drastically in pretty different ways. Um, 
So uh, as you know, we're making books. Books are a physical object at the end of the process. We are technically in an industry that is, uh, the end result is you know, physical manufacturing. Um, so before the pandemic, about 80 to 90% of my job still happened on paper. And I think that that is something for a lot of, you know, professionals in 2021 is shocking. Like, sure, sure, I have email and phone and that kind of thing. But I was working day in and day out with paper um, because, uh, you know, we would do Word documents for manuscripts. But once books were in layout, we looked at them printed out. Um, why? Because this is the way it had always been done. And at the end of the process, this is what it's going to be. So last March, uh, when we thought we were all going home to work two weeks, um, my department had a huge 48 hour scramble where we digitized every single one of our processes. Um, and I was really lucky because um, I had taken an interest in digital workflows uh, in 2019 and I had been piloting um, circling some of our interior materials using our digital workflow system because we had a digital workflow system that we would use for you know covers in the early part of the process and uh, so at least I knew how to do it and we could create some instruction for how everyone was going to do it because we had to you know as the central part of this process we had to create a system and get um, design and editorial and production on board with it. Um, so that was, uh, you know, I, I refer to March 13th, 2020 as the most exhilarating day of my career. Um, at one point, one of my colleagues was just standing at a scanner for four and a half hours because we had things that did not exist digitally. Um, <laughs> so now, Everything is completely paperless. Um, everything circs digitally up until final copies are mailed to editors. Um, we never see it on paper anymore unless we were to have our own printer at home and print it out for fun. Um, so that was a huge adjustment. Um, and I would say that it wasn't in the end that difficult of an adjustment, but we had to you know, familiarize ourselves with uh, you know, biggest difference being from the layouts to working with Adobe PDFs and how we're going to use that program to show markup and uh, streamline it so that everything's clear, you know, when the file is traveling from me to the editor and to the author and then back to me. And then I need to make sure that the changes that are being made are clear for the um, type department, the department who actually physically goes into the file and makes the changes. Um, so, you know, we had to come up with a lot of new systems because previously it was handwriting and there are a set of proofreader symbols that have been used, you know, for, I don't know, a hundred years. And that's how you would mark what changes were being made. Um, and in a way it's a little simpler online, but it's also a little bit more complicated because um, like, it's a little, it's like, it's like both faster and slower at the same time. And I'm sure everyone has their own, you know, stories about things like that. But um, we do know that when we go back to the office, not going back, uh, think of all the trees we're saving. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, at, in a lot of ways, this is, this is helpful because um, it's, it's, it's a lot less of like, you know, the physical travel of the first pass from, you know, we would mail it out to our freelancer and mail it back. And then, you know, I would walk it upstairs to the editor and they would, you know, either they'd gather the corrections they wanted the author to see, or they would mail the whole pass to the author and then it would come back. And it's, you know, it would never, it, I never had one get lost, but there's a lot of risk in that process that we've eliminated. Um, so that was the main thing about my job that changed. And then the other thing um, that I'll touch on is just that like a lot of industries last year, we ran into um, supply chain issues and slowdowns 
and there was a lot of concern about books being printed at the printers and uh, on sale dates being made. So that is something that we were really lucky um, in my department. Um, Managing Ed are the people who set the schedules um, when materials need to be, you know, final. And we have very aggressive padding for when we say they're final because things can happen at the printer, things can go wrong. And from our perspective, the one thing you never want to have happen is to have on Amazon that a book's going to go on sale and have the book not be in the warehouse ready to sell. So we were really lucky with our padding of dates that we had done on the back end. You know, books didn't miss on sale dates, um, but it was it was a crazy time. Uh, so so that's how stuff changed for me. I'll pass it over to Kara. And I'll start with that last thought about supply um, and stock um, because on my end, the last thing we want to be doing is putting marketing spend or time and effort behind something and then, oh, we're out of stock. And so, you know, Laura mentions meeting on sale dates for new books. It's also for how are we resupplying like our heavy backlist, like, you know, the very hungry caterpillar like that after all of these years, he's still hungry. That's what we like to say. Um, you know, that's been around for many years, but you know, there's someone on Laura's team who's having to say like, hey, we're, we're getting down to our last, you know, couple hundred copies or thousands. Laura will know those figures better than I will of like ones like the oh no <laughs> moment. But if you go to do that and then there was a backup at the printer, like we don't want to start like a big Easter themed promotion for Hungry Caterpillar if we're not going to have the book there. Um, because at the end of the day, then you can't sell it. You know, I I'm a consumer first too. Like if I see something is back ordered, like I'm not going to place the order right then. Um, so that was something that we absolutely had to look out throughout this um, whole year. And what I'll just say is at the beginning of the pandemic, um, families were home. Parents were like, how am I going to fill my child's time? So we saw an immediate boom um, in sales, especially in a lot of workbooks, activity books, things that are going to be able to give a kid 30 minutes of quiet time um, so the parent can maybe do their whole job the whole day. Um, so we were just having to really adjust what books we were talking about and what we were marketing. Of course, we wanted to still support the new books that we had coming out um, in our front list. That's always a big priority with our marketing, but we were just naturally seeing some books elevate because of the circumstances of the world. So what if we put a little bit of money into that or a little bit more social promotion? Can we goose those sales even more? So that's really how that changed for us. It wasn't just our seasonal flow of, okay, these are our books coming out between June and August. That's what we're going to talk about during this time. Um, and then discoverability of books dramatically shifted too. Um, so we really looked at our digital and online metadata. Um, again, that's how we are categorizing a book that maybe is 300 beautiful pages into two paragraphs. What are the key words to make it the best discoverable on online pages? Uh, so we really took some time to look into that um, and stopped all of our in-store promotions. Um, these are starting to come back up again and I'm very excited about that. That might be you know, different display cases. If we have a new book, like we'll work with indie booksellers and Barnes and Nobles to package those in a really beautiful way. We weren't printing and sending those to bookstores because we didn't have the book traffic. Um, so we were able to reallocate our funds and our time to really make sure that we were putting our efforts into how people were finding books this past year. Um, and I'll just say that the support for indie bookstores um, throughout the pandemic was also fantastic to see. Um, you know, they really were putting their hands up of like, we need help, um, you know, in-person foot traffic, our, our really close relationship with our local community and people that come into our stores every day, like that's how we do our business. Like what are new ways that we can, we can reach them? So we're still working with those accounts to make sure um, that, you know, they can stay afloat because again, they are the backbone of our business. Um, and then finally, the consumer festival piece, of course, changed immediately. Um, I actually went to a show in Texas uh, at the beginning of March, and I remember there being a lot of meetings of, should we be doing this? Does everyone feel comfortable with this? Do our authors feel comfortable? Are the kids still showing up? Um, and you know, at that point, of course, we did not have all the information uh, that we had probably a week later. So we did go um, and 
it's now baffling that that used to be a, a steady thing that I used to do once a month. Um, so I absolutely miss traveling. But what's been great is these organizations um, and book fairs have really, again, adapted to the virtual space. Um, so we've been able to do virtual events. Um, sometimes that's interactive events over Zoom like this, uh, where we're hosting trivia nights, um, or we're doing other fun interactive panels with our authors, uh, inviting kids to just come and play um, basically for an hour. And then of course the books are the, are the topic and, the, and what we're really trying to um, showcase. But really it's about like, do you wanna interact with our brand? Do you wanna interact with our authors? Like here's a way to still do that virtually. And the benefit of that is we're no longer limited by where we were regionally. So if I was going to a show in California, um, you know, I might see the 15,000 people in the Santa Monica area, um, but we now see a global audience from those events. Um, because of course these authors are not just known in, you know, the United States. So it's been great to interact with international and also communities that we don't typically target when we were going to in-person events. So it's just been spectacular to have better access um, to, you know, meeting authors and talking about our books to the kids that are really interested in it. Um, so I'm glad that we found a way to do that. And who knows really what the future of those type of events uh, go. I know some major conventions are starting to talk about what does in-person look like. Um, I think we're all holding our breaths on that and we'll see what happens. But, you know, again, in the, in the meantime, we've, we've found ways to, to adapt. And then next we wanted to talk about um, some projects that actually happened because of COVID and wanting to make sure that there were materials out there for readers um, during this time. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, we got talking about it and it was fun that we each had some examples. Um, so uh, I used to, I used to work, um, when I first came to Harper, I was um, specifically the production editor for our early readers program, which is our books um, that are aimed at ages from like zero to four. So a lot of board books and a lot of like character based books. So I worked on the baby shark program, but I did um, I got promoted out of that job right before the pandemic. So I didn't get to be the production editor who handled Baby Shark Wash Your Hands. It was, my, it was the person who, who took my spot. But um, one of the things about licensed books like this is that they tend to happen really, really quickly. Uh, the editor will, you know, sign up the license. And then, you know, because it's, it's, done a little differently. Uh, it's not like an artist is drawing it. It's coming from a, a television show or a movie or something. It will kind of be like one day it plops on your desk and you know that this thing is going to be done within two weeks. Well, Baby Shark is one of our, was one of our licensed programs. And when the pandemic hit, the editors talked to, you know, Pink Fong, the licensors about coming up with the idea of a book where baby sharks sings about washing your hands. Um, and uh, this, went, this came and went in-house in about eight days. And just for some perspective, a normal picture book, I see for the first time uh, the text of it sometimes 18 months before um, it goes to the printer because usually what happens is you see a story and we edit the text and then the artist illustrates it and then we review sketches and art and it's a very time intensive process um so some perspective this one came in book in eight days and it went on sale last june so if you have any interest in singing about washing your hands with your favorite yellow shark uh look for it, you know, at Target and all those other places. So. The Baby Shark song will now be in my head for the rest of the night. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Uh, and then Hello From Here is kind of an example on the other end. Um, this book comes out um, in August. So I remember hearing about this book. It's a, a love story um, set in the time of COVID, um, as you can see, uh, the character is wearing a mask on the cover. Um, and the editor brought this up to us uh, April, one month after the pandemic started. So 
these two authors had really put their heads together and come up with a captivating story about this time and what would it mean to be a teenager and having relationships amongst social distancing. And I remember when she first talked about it, I was like, well, when this book pubs like in over a year, we're gonna be fine. Like it, it won't be like this anymore. And here we are. Um, so I think this is gonna be a, a book that of course gets a lot of attention when it first comes out because you know it's of the current time. But I also think about you know, this starting a canon of stories about this time, like, you know, children are going to have to deal with this for, you know, the extent of their childhood and like growing up and really reflecting on what this time meant. Um, so I think, you know, these will be great tools um, to, to talk about that time in a relatable way. Um, so I just found that very interesting that one, again, two authors just thought about this almost immediately of it, of it being a need and there being a readership. Um, and then again, the fact that we're almost pubbing it and we are still um, in the current situation that this book is reflecting. Um, so I think it was very smart of everyone involved in the project. Um, and I'm interested to see what readers really gain from it. Okay. And then lastly, I think we were just gonna talk about um, some books and topics that are re really percolating um, in the children's marketplace right now. Um, Laura, were there any that you wanted to call out? I just, I just pulled in the, the New York Times bestseller list, which is one metric of showing uh, popularity. It is not the only metric, I will say that uh, very strongly. <laughs> yes, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so, I mean, what's really exciting, Kara and I have talked about this a lot about working on children's books. It's just um, like how exciting it is to know that the books that you're putting out into the world um, can make an impact on kids. And we both grew up, you know, readers, of, you can tell English and creative writing majors. Uh, so books, books are important to us. And um, I think a lot about like, I have the, I could do the work that I do on other kinds of content, but there's something that's uniquely rewarding about working on books for kids. Um, and I had on my slide a really, um, really cool picture book that just came out um, in my mosque, which is uh, a story that, you know, takes kids into different mosques all, all around the world and has a great back matter section on some of the history of Islam and things like that. And it's a beautiful book. The art is, is incredible. And, um, you know, it's a great, great opportunity for, you know, a, you know, a pretty book for a kid to look at to be a way to learn about a different culture. Um, and I think that things like that are really neat. Um, and, um, not that you know this has anything to do with the kind of work that I do. Like books like this are successful. I mean, I think if you were to look closely at all the New York Times bestsellers and things that are, are selling well in the bookstores, uh, parents and kids are looking for a really diverse range of perspectives, um, and you know they're looking to looking for reading to take them beyond their own own world into different worlds. And there's lots of different ways that you can do that, so. Absolutely, and really just ditto to that beautiful <laughs> statement from Laura. Um, it, it just gives children an opportunity to experience a character their age, but perhaps that's the only thing they have in common. Um, but hear from their voice. Um, and I think that is so important in the fundamental years. Um, and it's not just what we're teaching kids in classrooms, it's also what they're reading for fun. And, you know, in the boom of Hunger Games and Divergent, like at the core, those were adventure stories, but it was about oppressive societies. So, you know, I think a lot of times we might discount um, some books aimed at younger readers because, oh, there's a fun love, love triangle in it. Like, don't worry, that's just us distracting and getting a kid in there. And then we're gonna teach them some great lessons along the way. Um, so I really enjoy uh, the work for children's books because it also means a lot of diverse products. Um, you know, if you work for a young adult, I mean, a, a, an adult historical imprint, 
you're working on adult historical novels, um, whereas Laura and I are jumping between a beautiful picture book and, you know, a sci-fi adventure for 10 year old boys. Like it, it, it jumps and we get to really experience um, a lot of different products um, and make sure that, you know, there's different kids out there. Let's give them different books and make sure that every kid finds a book that they see themselves reflected in and then can learn about some other things in life as well. And I think that, uh, that sums us up, Laura, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you you hit the nail on the head. Uh, representation is the other thing that I was thinking of, but you just covered it, so. Great. Uh, well, thank you both very much. Um, just incredible, uh, I truly appreciate it. Um, so we do um, have some questions that I uh, had said had been pre-submitted, um, and then there are a couple uh, of new ones, so we'll start going through our, our questions. Um, one, um, question that we heard from several people. So we had a lot of people um, send in um, similar questions and it is mostly about um, find, like they have the book or they have the book in their, in their mind, uh, but they don't know what to do next. So it's, it's kind of that process of, you know, finding an agent. How do you find an agent? How do you pitch the idea? How do you submit a, manu uh, a manuscript? Um, some people have a, the pictures already done. Some are looking for an artist. Um, when, at what point do they find an artist to do the illustrations? Um, pretty much, I guess it's like from A to Z, what do you do about, I have a manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, you wanna start with that one? You want me to? <laughs> you, want me to? Uh, you can start you can start yeah 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 absolutely well first of all congrats for writing a book uh that's something i've never done and probably never will do um so to start off by finding an agent um i will say that it's a lot of uh blind submissions to different agencies um so you you just want to look at those online um and find accredited ones i would say you know look at their websites make sure that there are some authors that you recognize. Um, unfortunately, there are a few that are not as legitimate and don't have relationships with major publishers. So you want to make sure that you're finding an organization and an agent that is going to be able to get you where you want to go. Um, so I know that can be a frustrating and long experience. Um, there are some instances, um, I don't know examples for today, but sometimes people do accept submissions without an agent. So I would say also just keep your your eyes peeled for any of those um, opportunities. Um, they might be like a contest or um, like sometimes there's like charity things where um, if you bid on something for a charity, then like you might get an agent query through that. Um, of course, none of those things are guaranteed, but just might be other ways if you're not seeing success from sending your samples um, to those agencies directly. Um, and then for the picture book question about illustrators, um, it can be both. Um, so if you are an author and an illustrator, we absolutely publish um, books that you're writing the text and you're doing the pictures. Um, traditionally, um, if you have only the text, um, that's all you need. Um, and that is what the agent will submit to publishers on your behalf. And then it's then up to the publisher and editor to find an illustrator to team up for that project. So they would handle that portion of it once they um, decide to sign your book. Um, and Kara, real quick, just not to interrupt Laura, but with Kara, um, one of the questions was, do they, when they're submitting the text, mm -hmm. they submit it as just, you know, one page or do they actually break it up into pages of what a book would be? I think you could do either. Um, if you have a very strong vision for, again, if this is a picture book and you're like, on this side, I foresee like this two stanzas and a beautiful ocean illustration. Like you can kind of start to paint that picture with your words and descriptions. I would just put those like in brackets so that it's like seen as notes. Um, but I also think if you were just to submit typeset one page, like that's not gonna exclude you from a potential opportunity. Yeah, I would, I would have said the same thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I think I think I do see it a lot um, that authors do have their vision for the pages, like, especially with picture books, you kind of see like, you know, the page turn is a big moment in a picture book. Um, so if you have that vision, put it on the page. And if you don't, that's okay, too. So. 
Thank you. Um, so we also had a couple of questions. Um, Edna and Jason both uh, were talking about social media. Any, any tips to, for authors to promote their books on social media? Absolutely. Um, so I would say first and foremost, stay true to your voice. Um, it's it's kind of easy to tell if you're trying to put on a certain angle um, for your like promoting posts versus like what you're just naturally talking about, what you're naturally interested. Try to align those two voices so that way you come off as very authentic on your social media and it's not a really like jerk of like a, of a different voice when you're uh, your follower is then seeing you promote a book. Um, sweepstakes and giveaways are always a uh, good boost. So that's a good way to get new followers. Just retweet for a chance to win a copy of my book. Um, those always are really turnkey ways to do that. Um, and then I would say also develop relationships with people in your social media community. So if there's some authors that perhaps you've um, had an event with before, I've been at the same conference or something, shoot them a friendly DM um, or, you know, just start following them. And again, having organic, um, organic conversations um, on social media to establish those relationships. And you never know what could come at that. And then again, like mutual followers are seeing that happening and seeing you as a person and a creator that they then look up to. Um, and that can always help with then when you're trying to promote and sell your book online. Um, Kathleen asks, uh, does either of your publishing companies donate books to organizations that promote literacy among um, at-risk youth? Yes, um, we do a significant amount of book donation over the course of a year, but HarperCollins specifically has a relationship with the organization Change for Kids, um, which is about with not focused exclusively on literacy, but just about um, kids who are disadvantaged, um, making sure that they have resources. So we, we do books, but we also do financial donations to, to that organization as well on an annual basis. Same here, uh, the big company that we work is uh, Reading is Fundamental. Um, and then we also will target um, certain moments or celebrations or events, and we'll also chip in for maybe a one-time donation, or um, as Laura said, a financial one as well, to support um, different events um, that are aimed towards uh, dis at youth, uh, risk youth and disadvantaged communities. Um, and then not um, a donation, but we have to call out Dollywood. Um, that is Dolly Parton's um, publishing um, company. So she will purchase books from us. Um, and then her goal is to get those books into hands of kids that need books. Um, so again, that's not just a donation part on ours, it's, it's Dolly Parton's great work, uh, but we have a really great um, relationship with her and I know Harper Collins does too. So it's just incredible the uh, foundation that she has built to really you know, make sure every kid can get a book. Yeah, it is an incredible foundation. And I just, actually today I learned that it's it's not just within the United States, that it's actually global, like it's international that she um, has expanded it to, to um, uh, multiple countries. And so an another thing to warm your heart. So uh, <laughs> good, thank you. Um, Scott, at, or uh, Josh asks, I'm sorry, and this is probably the million dollar question that everybody in the, uh, uh, in the book world wants to know is how hard is it to predict um, if a book is going to be successful or not? Me? I have no idea. How <laughs> 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 uh, that is true. Um, so, go ahead. Keep going <laughs> no, I was going to say from my perspective, like from my position in the job, I know when we want a book to be successful because we're the the hope is that this book is going to be successful. We're investing a little bit extra time in creating selling materials for it. Um, and, or we know that the author is really important. So we're treating them really carefully, but whether it actually works out, that that's Kara's domain, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, yes, we, we try our best, um, but sometimes we are surprised too. I will say like in both ways, we might have, really high expectations for a book and 
unfortunately, it's not meeting those expectations. That doesn't mean it's not doing well, but it's just not, you know, where we thought it was be. Or there might be a book that like, there's a lot of internal love for. Um, we maybe aren't getting as many books out there into the world, but then all of a sudden it's performing really well. And so we really adapt to the marketplace and to the response. Um, so as Laura said, on the marketing side, we absolutely do have, you know, books that we really put a lot of our efforts into as we're leading up to the on sale date, but really that it is a let's watch and wait and see um, when it's out there. Like, what are people saying in their reviews online? Um, what's the word of mouth? Like, that is just the, the marketing tool that, like, you never can um, have a handle on really. Um, you know, it's the same way as like what Netflix shows all of a sudden everyone's talking about Bridgerton and then other ones, you know, don't bubble up like that. Uh, that's Shonda Rhimes. That's the reason for that now that I say it. But uh, <laughs> that's really like, you know, we're, we're watching and listening. That's a lot of what marketing is. Um, and then the other thing I'll bring up is that it's really fundamental to have the books in the bookstores uh, to be discovered. Like that's really the first metric to make sure. So again, that's doing that work at the very beginning. It's like, is Barnes and Noble going to take a promotional quantity where they're putting these on uh, outward facing bookshelves so that you walk in and it's maybe right next to the cafe area um, and it's hitting you in the face with that book cover or if it's spine in the shelves, you're less likely to find that just from the nature of the size and there being so many fantastic books. Um, so I would say that's the first key to us um, is as we get ready for on-sale placement, it's how many books do we have out in the marketplace because that's the potential readership at that moment. And then of course that can adjust as a book has a very, very long life. Uh, we find that the first 12 weeks are really um, important to watch because um, that sometimes gives us our trends um, for how it's going to backlist, but there is a backlist life and there's different opportunities where maybe there's a movie tie-in um, or a, a different um, moment for an author. Whereas like their third book is really the one that, you know, is successful right out of the gate and then people discover their earlier books. So I would say there's a lot to the equation and there's not just, you know, one answer, unfortunately, but I would say it's, it's watching the marketplace, what else is working um, and then making sure our product is out there and discoverable for readers. Good. Thank you. Um, Jillian asked the question, she and her father are working on a book about poetry for children. Um, and uh, she notices that there's not, it doesn't appear to be a high demand um, for poetry books. Um, would the process of trying to get it published be the same or is there, is there any guidance that you can offer, um, offer she and, and her father? Yeah, I think, I think um, it, it would start the same. You, you want to find um, an agent and uh, you know, get it out there in front of my eyes. Um, and I would say, from, from my perspective, there is, uh, I think there's space for poetry in, in, in a younger reader's, uh, you know, format. We do have, um, I've worked on more than one uh, novel in verse for a middle grade audience. We have a lot of books in verse for um, young adults. And then also um, picture books, you know, if it's for very young children, if you can think of your poetry from the perspective of what it would look like on an illustrated page. Um, I have picture books that are basically illustrated poetry. So I think that there's definitely space in the domain for it. Good. Thank you. Um, Jason is wondering, do you recommend self-publishing uh, versus going with a publisher? Mm -hmm. I'd say it depends on your goal. Um, you know, self-publishing is a tool out there. Um, again, I'd say make sure you're reading all of the fine print. Some self-publishing, you know, asks for monetary um, from you. They ask you for money to publish and you really shouldn't have to be doing too much of that um, throughout the process. Um, so I would say watch out for those. Um, it's, it's really the difference between having a team behind your book or being your own one person team. So, you know, there's definitely ways that you self publish to make sure you're promoting and you're getting your book out there and you, know, you can have it placed on different places where people discover their books from traditional publishing houses. Um, but you, you might have to work a little bit harder yourself than 
when you do have a publisher and an agent who's really like working on your behalf. Um, that's what we're all here for. So um, if your goal is just to get your book out there and you want to make sure that you know, those close to you know what's out there and they can read it and it's printed and you can hold it and be like, I created this, then self-publishing, absolutely. I would say if you're trying to find a wider audience or have uh, higher hopes of being like a, a very popular, well-known author, you might have a better shot with a uh, publishing house than with self-publishing. That's not to say that it can't help it with self-publishing. Again, it's kind of that like magic sauce that we can't really nail down of like, what books really percolate to the top. All right, thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, Katie asks, and so does Abby, um, and it's about marketing. And um, so what percentage of marketing is author driven? Um, and do you leverage your authors for events and social media? Um, and, and what works and what, what, uh, what, what doesn't? <laughs> So I think I'll go back to my previous answer about social media. It depends on the author and it depends on their personality and what is organic to them. Um, if we have an author who is using a pseudonym and you know would rather be off camera, not really talking about their book out in the open, we're not going to ask them to do that. Like that's then where you have the publishing team. Like that's what we're there for. We will be your spokesperson. We will be the loud mouth shouting about how great your book is. Um, but that said, if there is an author who's very interested in you know, putting their own efforts behind their book, we absolutely partner with them. Um, we just ask that they like keep us in the loop about what they wanna do. Um, again, if there's certain things they wanna book on their own, we're happy to either help form those relationships and make sure those things happen or let them roll with their ideas and we roll with ours and we make sure they all go in tandem and we we put them together when it makes sense. So yeah, it's, it's never the same for, you know, all the different authors that we have. Um, and I would just say that it, it, it can be hard to promote a book. Like it's hard to just stand up there and be like, I made this, like pay attention to me, please. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a personality thing. It's a comfort thing. And we want to make sure that we're, you know, doing best by our authors and our creators. Like they made us the product, like at the end of the day, it's, it's up to us to make sure that, you know, we can take it from there. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, how involved is the author um, uh, with the inside flap doing the summaries? Um, I'm not very involved. Um, that copy is written by editorial um, because you know, you want it to be written in a way that is going to dr draw the reader in. The author has already written the whole book. And so, you know, sometimes when you're very close to a project, you maybe, you maybe can't see the best way to explain it to another person. So that's why editorial will write that. And they review the cover, they see it, um, you know, probably up until, it, you know, three or four times up until it's final, they get to, they have input on, how it's going to look. And if they wanted to tweak a word, you know, that they totally can, but they don't have to write that copy. Good, thank you. Um, both Jenny, Ruth and Patricia um, have uh, another aging question. Um, do you recommend the for-profit conferences that promise to connect authors with agents? Um, and then do major publishing houses only accept manuscript, manuscripts from agents? For that first one, I will say I do not have enough information or experience with those conferences. Um, I would just again say, make sure you know up front what that monetary amount is and what an organization is looking for. Um, it's not irregular for literary conferences to have a cost associated um, the same way as like when we go to a concert, like, you know, we pay for our tickets. So sometimes, you know, there is a get yourself into the door. I don't think they can promise you that then you walk out with a book deal with an agent after that. Um, but again, I don't really have a lot of experience, but I would just make sure you know everything right when you're getting into that. Um, and then second question, um, there are times that publishers will say like, hey, we are looking for manuscripts for everybody. Um, you know, it, it's not frequent. Um, there is an imprint um, at my team called Coquila Books. Um, they did do that. They are a um, imprint um, that started really to make sure that marginalized voices and creators 
have a place in traditional publishing. Um, so they did actually sign up a project, um, a picture book that's coming out, um, I believe early next year um, from that call. Um, but I, I'm not sure if that's still open or if there's other organizations that are also doing it. So I'd say it just unfortunately takes like a lot of constant research um, to see what new opportunities might pop up from that way. Thank you. Um, here's a question for both of you, and it's actually one that was even on my mind. So um, do either of you have a favorite book or project that you have worked on? Yeah, um, I have I have like a lot of favorites, of course. Um, like, <laughs> I will go with, um, I worked on um, Lewis Sacker's uh, fourth uh, wayside school book. So I don't know if anyone, you know, these, this series of books started in the eighties and then, uh, you know, there were three books, um, you know, wayside school is upside down. I can't remember the titles right now, but, uh, a couple years ago, he decided he wanted to, uh, he wanted to add to the series. There hadn't been a new book since 1995. Um, and I remember reading them when I was like in third grade. So to get to work on, you know, the fourth book in the series and they're just like, they're just really funny. Like it's just a joy to work on a book like that. Um, so I, that came out last year. It's called Wayside School Beneath the Cloud of Doom. And, um, you know, there's not really a deeper message behind like, the humor in the books but also there really is I found that book just like so refreshing with every everything that the world was in 2020 so <laughs> I'll go with that as my favorite my answer that comes to mind is absolutely nostalgia based as well um I was obsessed with Sarah Dessen novels um when I was younger um she wrote a lot of like southern summer romance stories um and I got to work on one of her front list books um and that was a very surreal moment for me, uh, just because I remember loving those books when I was 12 and 13. And then I got to be in a meeting room with her and talk about her book. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And then the other one I'll mention um, is the last Kids on Earth series. Uh, we call it The Walking Dead for middle schoolers. Um, so it's about the zombie monster apocalypse. Um, it's highly illustrated. So we find that there's a lot of reluctant readers um, that come to that. and. Again, I just love seeing some younger kids that are like, this is the first book that I really pick up and I enjoyed reading it because it's funny. Uh, the kids are shooting Oreos out of uh, Nerf guns. Like, I love this so much. Um, and it's been an interesting project on the marketing side because we have a lot of partnerships with different um, content now. Um, so it's a Netflix original series. There's a video game coming out um, next month. Um, there's a toy line. There's t-shirts at Hot Topic. Um, so it's been so cool to watch the brand grow and really um, have different relationships with cartoonists and with toy producers and, and video game producers. And how can we put all of our marketing together knowing that there's one author named Max Brailler at the center of it. Um, so it's just been great to work on like kind of different projects um, with that property. Good. Thank you. Um, I'm being very watchful of time. Uh, we have so many other great questions. Um, and we've been talking a lot about um, books and manuscripts and how to find agents and things like that. But what what is your advice about just getting into the publishing industry? I mean, both of you fresh from Susquehanna got into the publishing industry and what is your advice to for uh for people to do that to break into that um I know Kara has a, a good a good story about this too about how she got in but I know for me um I had an internship that where I was able to like develop my copy editing skills and I never would have been able to get the kind of job that I have now without having a little bit of background in that. So if you're really interested in like that kind of work, like copy editing and, and working with text like that, um, there's a lot of um, different like colleges and continuing learning institutes that offer like a class on it. I know that there's a class at NYU. Um, I know that there's one at the University of Washington. Um, and I'm sure that there's more that I haven't even heard of but it's basically just an opportunity to like study how to look at text like that. And if you're interested in doing this kind of work, you'll want to have a little bit of background in how to, how to read in that way. Um, 
And I would say otherwise, like you do, you do have to be passionate about books um, because you know this is uh, an industry that a lot of uh, a lot of people who you know studied English in college, they're like, oh, I should work with books. <laughs> um, so if you don't like books, you'll be very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> A very astute point there. No, for sure. Like whenever, uh, you know, we, we interview people, our first thing is like, you know, what are you reading right now? Like, what books do you like from our company? Um, so I would say knowing, you know, some of the books, wherever you might be interviewing or even sending a cover letter, I would say, like, you can stand out by just, you know, laundry listing a few books from that publisher or that imprint. And you're like, I enjoyed these ones. Like, that shows your interest. Uh, that's a very, like, detailed uh, response to that. Um, so I, yeah, right after Susquehanna, I did do a program at NYU. Um, and my goal with that was to learn more about publishing. I was so happy to be able to learn it foundationally at Susquehanna. I remember when I was putting my resume out there, like SG was one of the only places that had that minor. So I, like, I think that really benefited um, Laura and I as we, as we started out um, our careers. Um, and at the beginning, I just thought, okay, I need to get to New York. If I can get to New York, I can get into publishing. What's very exciting about this time, and as we are all figuring out what's hybrid, what's remote work, I think publishing is going to open up, um, and there's the possibility for there to be more diverse areas and communities involved in publishing, because it's not going to be a requirement that you live in Manhattan or in the surrounding area. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see how that shakes out in the next couple of years. Um, so that's no longer the advice that I give to people. It's not, you know, move to New York and cross your fingers, uh, which is really what I did. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's knowing the books, uh, it's knowing the industry. And then for marketing, um, I did take uh, business courses at Susquehanna too. So I think that helped show that like, I care about, like what the meat of this is, but I also know how to, you know, be the loudspeaker on the marketing business side of it. Um, so if you're interested in book marketing, I would say dip your toes um, in both areas. So that way you can really talk as an expert, both as content and as, you know, the, the business side of it. Um, so one statement, uh, President Green says, thank you both for an absolutely fascinating, fascinating presentation. Um, so wanted to give that shout out to you. And I know we're over, uh, just one more question because I think it's, it's very pertinent to books because it's how we all were introduced. Um, so Lisa says, you mentioned a lot about getting books and marketing them to booksellers, but what about libraries? Um, in what ways are libraries considered um, in the publishing world? Yeah, thank you for asking that. And we have yeah. a fantastic school and library team. Um, so I am in no way the expert of that, but they're doing a lot of what I'm doing for, uh, you know, booksellers in the library world. So they're doing that for that same thing of like, they get those early manuscripts, they read them, they're like, this is gonna absolutely be like candy for librarians and for their readers there they send them those materials, they make sure they're equipped. Um, there's also a really great community of school and library conferences um, throughout the year. So again, what I'm doing for, for teenagers and for you know, general consumers, they're also doing for librarians um, and educators. So that way, you, know, you can come learn from our publishing teams firsthand. Like these are the five books that we think are gonna be great tools for your classroom or your library programming um, this year. So yeah, they work nonstop. They also do all of our award submissions. Um, so of course the big one in children's liter uh, literature is like the Newberry Honor. Um, so they're working with those organizations too um, and helping us get, um, ahead in that marketplace too. So yeah, they, they are an incredible group. Um, and I actually just like was almost in tears recently. They did a like educators appreciation video um, with a bunch of our authors, just like saying like, wow, teachers really had it this past year <laughs> with COVID. They had a really, really hard job. Um, so yeah, that, that part of our marketing team is really working to, to help with those relationships and support the teachers and librarians that are like talking and educating our, um, our, our kids uh, every day. Good. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you. Um, I know we've gone over um, and I know we have some questions that weren't answered, um, but again, uh, Kara and Laura, 
Um, I can't thank you enough um, this evening. I told you this hour flies by and uh, it really does. Um, the two of you are incredible. Thank you for taking the time out um, to, to talk with all of us and to educate us. Um, it, was, it was phenomenal, so thank you. Thank you for having us. This, the hour really did fly. Uh, I told you so. it would. I told you it would. So, um, well, great. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I um, hope you enjoyed uh, this amazing conversation. Um, and stay tuned. We've got, we have more coming uh, in, later this month and in June. Um, so a lot more to come. So again, everybody, thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful night. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>